Hi, I'm Dr. Mabrutis. I'm a congenital heart surgeon here at uh, Florida Hospital for Children, and I'm the uh, director of the Congenital Heart Institute. And the purpose of uh, this webinar is to introduce uh, to uh, our public uh, some of the uh, fine um, parts of congenital heart disease and congenital heart surgery. One way to look at congenital heart surgery is to compartmentalize it into the various forms. Remember that congenital heart disease starts in the womb and it's all about holes in the heart, obstructions in the heart, various uh, arteries being switched around, uh, other uh, uh, chambers not being connected to the chambers that they're supposed to be connected to. It sometimes can be a nightmare for the diagnostician and the surgeon. However, there are ways of, of uh, compartmentalizing these, um, these diseases and they can be put into the following uh, way. That the operations can be palliative, which means that they are performed uh, for a short period of time so that the baby can grow. And that uh, these are based on two basic, two things. One is that if there is not enough blood flow that gets to the lungs, then we'll do what's called a systemic to pulmonary artery shunt, increasing the blood flow to the lungs. If there is too much blood flow to the lungs, then we can do a pulmonary artery banding, which decreases the flow and allows the baby uh, to grow older, uh, at which time a more definitive and corrective operation could be performed. The corrective operations are, as I alluded to earlier, uh, we relieve obstructions, we eliminate the left to right or right to left uh, uh, shunts, which are communications within the heart. Uh, we can also do these uh, with, as a closed procedure without the use of, of the heart-lung machine, or we can use them as an open procedure uh, using the heart-lung machine. This is a diagram showing the red arrow that communicates the left ventricle to the right ventricle. The arrow is in the direction of blood flow, and the reason why it's red is because it's oxygenated blood from the left ventricle moving to the right side. Now this is a problem in any uh, child uh, because it overloads the pulmonary circulation. Uh, on the other hand, there's another patient with the same hole in the heart, but if you notice that there is a blue arrow here. In this case, you can see that the pulmonary artery above the right ventricle, which is the uh, small uh, seagull kind of, um, of uh, f um, figure there, is small compared to the what it was before. And, and this, uh, because it's so small, does not allow blood flow to get to the lungs. And as a result, the blue blood on the right side of the heart goes over to the left side of the heart, mixes with the red blood, and as a result, this patient is blue, so-called cyanotic. So this is just an example of some of the issues that are operative when one performs a diagnosis and a thera therapeutic procedure in a patient with congenital heart disease. Now this is a very nice drawing of how we perform a systemic to pulmonary artery shunt. The, uh, the history of this systemic to pulmonary artery shunt dates back to uh, Johns Hopkins University when uh, Dr. Blaylock and uh, uh, Dr. Tausig devised an operation uh, that, that will uh, shunt blood from the systemic circulation to the pulmonary circulation for those blue babies. And for those of you who are old enough, you may, rec you may remember in Life magazine uh, that the blue babies uh, were uh, palliated and had almost a miraculous recovery because of this shunt. What many of you remember recently was the uh, tele a television uh, program that recognized the contribution of Vivian Thomas, who was one of the uh, technicians who worked with um, uh, Dr. Blaylock in determining this, uh, this shunt. Uh, he was a very uh, bright um, and energetic African-American man who worked at uh, Johns Hopkins during this time and some people even call this shunt now uh, the blaylock Tausig thomas shunt, appropriately so for the contributions that were uh, put together by those three uh, very talented and smart individuals. Remember, as, you, as I uh, stated before, that sometimes there's too much blood flow going to the lungs. Under those circumstances, one might have to perform a, pu a pulmonary artery band. You can notice here in this very beautiful colored photograph, uh, not a photograph, in this beautifully colored um, 
drawing uh, the, that there is a band placed around the pulmonary artery, and this limits the flow to the lungs. This is a palliative operation and is used only for a short period of time so that the baby can grow and have this uh, a definitive operation. This is another um, uh, color drawing of a patient who has an abnormal communication between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, and this is called a patent ductus arteriosus. You can see that the red blood is uh, moving up from the arch of the aorta uh, and also going through this ductus arteriosus into the pulmonary artery. This causes a left to right shunt, increased blood flow to the lungs, and this is not a very good situation uh, for anyone. This, uh, are, these are two uh, um, drawings showing just how this uh, ductus arteriosus is uh, clamped and ligated. You can see in the drawing that there is a yellow structure a line that uh, divides and comes back again. That's the uh, vagus nerve and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Uh, uh, unfortunately, these uh, nerves are not this color in, in real life, and, uh, and they don't uh, uh, announce themselves to us surgeons, uh, so we really have to be very careful where these lie and not to interrupt them. This recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, uh, innervates one of the vocal cords, um, and uh, we generally do a very good job of avoiding any injury to that nerve. You can see here that uh, the, the, uh, the ductus arteriosus is cut in sections and it's over sewed with suture material and when it's all over the ductus is ligated and divided and the patient is uh, basically cured from this problem. Uh, innovation takes its forms in many ways. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a drawing showing that in fact this uh, closure of a patent ductus arteriosus can be performed uh, without surgery in some cases, and this uh, shows in, in uh, figure uh, um, A, B, C, and D how uh, one can use various uh, plugs, uh, devices to close the, the patent ductus arteriosus through a catheter that's placed in the artery in the groin. So this does not require an operation. It is an operative procedure, but it does not require an incision in the chest to, uh, to, look at, uh, to uh, identify the ductus and divide it. And uh, this is basically what, how we do things today. The only reason why we would do an operation is because the ductus can be too large and too friable for this uh, procedure to be performed. There are holes in the hearts, in hearts uh, with congenital heart disease. Some of them uh, are uh, holes that communicate uh, with, the up, with the collecting chambers, that is to say the right atrium and the left atrium. Uh, in these next few slides, I'll show you the different kinds of uh, uh, defects that can be found in the atrium. This uh, photograph, he, uh, this uh, drawing here shows a, an atrial septal defect, ASD, atrial septal defect of the secundum variety. It's just a name. Uh, it has embryologic uh, sources of it, but um, that would require a course in embryology, which is really not necessary. So you can see in the middle of, the, of that um, of that uh, opening of the right atrium that there is a hole there and that is what's called an ostium secundum defect. It's uh, in incumbent on us to uh, close that because uh, if we don't and if you have an atrial septal defect that's large uh, you have a 20, 20 year uh, deficit in your lifespan so if you're going to live to 80 then you would live to 60 uh, etc. This is another kind of uh, uh, atrial septal defect it's called an atrial septal defect primum type. This one's associated with a, a cleft in the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. You can see that there are two valves. One is, a, is above and one below, and you can see that there is a, a moiety, or there is a space in the anterior leaflet there that needs to be closed with uh, sutures in order to repair the valve. One other type of an atrial septal defect is called the sinus venosus defect. You can see the hole there to the left inside the right atrium and that's associated with uh, unusual drainage of the pulmonary veins. Remember the pulmonary veins are red blood coming back to the heart. We don't want them to mix with the blue blood also coming back to the heart. So the idea is to repair this so that the patient can get on with his or her life. This is an operative photograph and you can see right in the middle there uh, with the white uh, 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 skeleton if, of the heart, so to speak, you can see that that's the atrial septal defect. There's blood behind it in the left atrium, and the idea is to close it with a pericardial patch. You can see here, slide, you can see here that the, that the pericardial patch is placed into the area of the atrial septal defect and closed with suture technique. 
again, innovation has helped us in this regard. This is a um, Amplatzer um, um, device that can actually close an atrial septal defect through the uh, through the uh, 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 peripheral vein. In this case, the femoral vein. This cannot always be used, but it, there are some conditions and some types of atrial septal defects in which one can use this Amplatzer technique. Uh, uh, it's a, a very uh, good technique and has worked uh, quite well, especially in those patients that have rather small atrial septal defects. Of course, there are other holes in the heart. One of them, uh, another location is in the pumping chambers of the heart, the left, between the left and the right sided uh, pumping chambers. You can see here the, uh, through the tricuspid valve there, and, which is being retracted by those blue sutures, that there is a hole be, be, uh, right behind the tricuspid valve, and that's called a ventricular septal defect. Uh, many times these ventricular septal defects close by themselves, that is to say they close naturally, uh, however others do not and, and require surgical attention. This is an operative photograph showing in the middle how a large, a large ventricular septal defect can be exposed uh, in, from the right atrium. Right in the, in the upper part of that, uh, that hole, uh, you'd think is uh, some piece of tissue that's not just some ordinary piece of tissue, that's the aortic valve. And the aortic valve can prolapse, or that, that is to say, it can fall into the hole and cause leakage of the uh, aortic valve. And so it's imperative uh, that this patient requires that uh, ventricular septal defect to be closed and also to support the uh, aortic valve so that it doesn't leak anymore. This is a, a photograph, uh, excuse me, this is a, this is a um, drawing showing how a Dacron patch can be sewed into the area where the ventricular septal defect is and lowered into the area and, and tied in succession, thereby closing the ventricular septal defect uh, effectively. There is, a, um, there is a type of defect that is both an atrial and a ventricular type of defect and it's associated with uh, abnormal um, atrioventricular valves. That is to say the valves that go from the upper chambers of the heart into the heart, into the ventricular portion of the heart, are uh, are called a tricuspid valve or a mit uh, and a mitral valve. There are two of them. All of us have these two valves, unless we have complete atrioventricular canal, which is a very unusual type of uh, defect. Uh, these, this, uh, this drawing uh, showing A, B, and C are the various types of atrioventricular canal. Notice that these valves don't really resemble anything normal. Uh, that is to say, they don't look like a tricuspid valve or a mitral valve. These valves have to be sculpted into a tricuspid and a mitral valve. And uh, that can be done, and I'll show you in the next uh, couple of slides. This is uh, showing how the, uh, the left-sided uh, atrioventricular valve is sutured together. Uh, and uh, that's the, co the co closure of the cleft. The ventricular septal defect portion has already been closed. and. Um, and uh, now that where you can see the, the dotted lines there, that's the pericardium that has to be uh, cut to size to close the rest of the atrial septal defect. So one has to not only close the ventricular septal defect, not only close the atrial septal defect, but also sculpt the new valves into a right-sided valve and a left-sided valve. Well, if that's not complex enough, now we're going on to something even more complex. And that is, uh, this poor child was, uh, well, this is a drawing of a child who was born with what we call truncus arteriosus. There are two basic forms. One is the pulmonary artery form and the other one is the aortic form. But in, in essence, this is a baby that has a hole in the pumping chambers of the heart. And instead of having two uh, vessels coming off the heart like you and I have, this one has only one vessel coming off the heart. So this one vessel gives rise to the aorta, which is the big vessel that, that supplies red blood to the body, and the pulmonary artery, which is the vessel uh, which supplies blood to the pulmonary artery so that uh, it can be oxygenated. Here, everything is mixed, and, uh, and there is no valve for the pulmonary valve. So it becomes a, uh, a, rather, a rather challenging aspect to fix this because one has to take the pulmonary artery component away from this trunk, uh, close the ventricular septal defect, uh, defect, and establish communication between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. And here is a, 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 a drawing 
showing how the ventriculocephal defect was closed. If you can see through the uh, ventricular opening that the patch was placed to close the ventriculocephal defect, thereby separating the circulations. The pulmonary artery was now taken off of the trunk. Uh, and then uh, because we don't, because there's only one valve, we have to uh, uh, thaw a frozen homograft that we have in our, in our system. That is to say, this, this homograft, which is really a pulmonary artery that was preserved by, from another human being and frozen and thawed and then used to replace the pulmonary valve in this uh, repair. So there it is being sutured into the right ventricle. This patient now had only, who started off with only one valve in the outflow tracts of the um, ventricles now has the appropriate number, which is two. The problem with this, however, is that the native valves will grow, this will not grow, and this baby will be looking forward to two, maybe three more operations in his or her life. Congenital heart surgery became a household wor uh, word with the advent of the repairs that were used to treat the blue babies. And these blue babies were, were uh, highlighted in Life Magazine, Post Magazine, and all the uh, journals of the day back in the mid 50s and early 60s. And these blue babies were the babies that were born with Tetralogy of Fellow. And what Tetralogy of Fellow would indicate that there are four problems, really there are only two problems. One of them is a hole between the pumping chambers and one there's a very tight uh, blockage of the uh, blood flow going to the pulmonary artery. So if there's no blood flow going to the pulmonary artery, the baby can't oxygenate the blood and therefore is blue. Uh, operations have been devised uh, with the, uh, with the uh, um, introduction of the heart-lung machine in 1956 where, um, whereby these, uh, this hole can be closed and then the outflow tract to the right ventricle and to the pulmonary artery could be augmented thereby making the baby as, uh, as, uh, as uh, normal as possible. This is an uh, arteriogram. What is an arteriogram? It's, uh, it's a uh, contrast material being placed uh, uh, in the, in the uh, chamber of a heart and then allowing a motion picture of x-rays to take, uh, to take uh, place. And this is just a still of one of those motion pictures. You can see that the, um, uh, the blood flow from that right ventricle out to the pulmonary artery is, is obstructed by those two muscle fibers that to prevent the blood flow. It's the uh, incumbent on the surgeon to get rid of those uh, muscle bundles and to close the ventriculocephal defect, thereby repairing the, uh, the problem. Uh, this is something that uh, was um, uh, introduced uh, in, at Children's Memorial Hospital um, where I was um, in, the, uh, in the early part of uh, uh, this, this century. Um, you can see there there's an upside down Y incision in this pulmonary artery. We found that we could preserve the pulmonary valve instead of cutting it in a significant number of patients and this is the technique that we used. We used this per pericardial pantaloon patch, pantaloon being a French, uh, Italian, uh, Spanish word for pants and you can see it is in the form of a pants and we sutured it into the area above the pulmonary valve and this is what it looks like. Uh, after the operation is performed. We noticed that we could actually preserve the pulmonary valve instead of cutting it in a significant number of babies, which uh, increased the chance of them not having to have a further operation in the future. That's innovation, and, and we expect that there's going to be more innovative approaches to this, uh, to this uh, disease process. That's just a, a snapshot of what we do with the congenital uh, heart disease and congenital heart surgery. The idea is to get rid of the obstructions, get rid of the holes, to put structures back where they're supposed to be, and all of this uh, doing it in a short period of time with the least um, bother to the child and to the whole process. So we look forward to uh, repeating this uh, in the future, and, uh, and uh, I hope that you are able to get some of the information that you probably wanted out of this, and uh, we'll, we look forward to seeing you sometime at another webinar. Thank you very much and have a nice day.